It's that time of year. It's spring. And also when we talk about having the conversation. Which conversation are we talking about? Join us to find out. Hello and welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Dr. Kathy Rowe, Executive Director of New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, and I'd like to welcome our guest today, Tracy Grafton. Tracy is a social worker who specializes in palliative care services. Tracy is also a board member for one of our partners, Goals of Care Coalition of New Jersey. So Tracy, thank you for joining us today and to talk about advanced care planning. Now, we usually talk about advanced care in our April episode because April 16th is National Healthcare Decisions Day. It was created to inspire, educate, and empower healthcare providers and the general public about the importance of advanced care planning. This year, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to meet Evelyn and walk with her through the years as she thinks about planning ahead at different stages of her life. We'll see how her thoughts change and how life experiences change her priorities and her ideas over time. Our hope is that you will find something relatable in each of the scenes as Evelyn starts to think about having the conversation with her family. But first, Tracy, can you start by telling us what palliative care is and how you as a social worker work with patients and their families and their providers? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak about my favorite topic, advanced <laughs> care planning, um, and to clarify um, what palliative care is. Okay. Um, I find that more people don't know what it is versus do, so I'm glad to be able to help people understand. Um, first and foremost, I, I'll put out there that we often are confused with hospice care. Mm -hmm. I formerly worked in hospice for 20 years, and I've been working in palliative medicine now for about two and a half. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that while they share some similarities, they are very different. Um, palliative medicine is a specialty, just like any other, like cardiology, okay. oncology, endocrinology. But their specialty is really in alleviating and addressing physical, emotional, and spiritual symptoms that are... Um, arise when a person and their family are living with a serious illness and the impact of that. The focus is really on providing education, mm -hmm. fostering good communication, and ensuring that this patient and family understand what disease or diseases they're living with and how to navigate that mm -hmm. um, with their values and making sure that their voice gets heard in the chaos of a very complex healthcare system. So it sounds like there's not a right or wrong answer or a right or wrong way to do this. It depends on the person's values and their, and their family's values and decisions. Absolutely. You know, I like to say it's as unique as the snowflakes are. Um, a good care plan is personalized mm -hmm. to that patient and their family. Okay. And what are some of the documents and discussions and decisions we're talking about? Like, what are examples of what people would be talking about? Well, what we're really talking about is advanced care planning, which is a generic term, mm -hmm. umbrella term, for the kinds of documents that you need that actually very simply do two things. All right. Name a person that you trust who knows you well and is willing to be your healthcare spokesperson. We're not talking about an emergency contact. Okay. That's different. You're right. That's who you can call if I'm hospitalized and there's an emergency, who can you notify? All right. Versus someone who's really an advocate for you and who knows what your healthcare wishes are and is willing to um, uh, speak up, mm -hmm. ask good questions, and just make sure that your voice and your values are heard in, in the, like I said, the chaos of it all. Um, so two parts. Number one, identifying a person who wants to take on that responsibility for you. And who might that be, usually? It honestly could be any adult person. It oftentimes is someone related to you. Mm -hmm. It's usually a spouse, okay. um, a, an adult child. It could be nieces, nephews, a close friend, um, a cousin. Um, but most importantly, someone who really knows you well and is willing and is accessible. Mm -hmm. The second part of any good document 
is now getting into what kind of care you would or would not want if you were facing a very serious health condition mm -hmm. and life support was being considered for you mm -hmm. um, and under what circumstances uh, would maybe life support be too much for you okay. and you know getting into sort of the myriad of, of healthy issues that you might face as you advance in age or advance through a serious illness. Okay. So let's meet Evelyn. Evelyn is in her 60s. She's still working. She has no major health issues and she's divorced with grown children. She recently lost a dear friend who she's going to talk about and that friend's family talked openly about their health care decisions. At a recent doctor's visit, Evelyn's doctor asked if she had a living will. So let's see what Evelyn is thinking about. So I'm in my 60s. I I'm healthy enough have a high blood pressure a little bit, and I have high cholesterol, but it's in my family. And, um, you know, maybe I'm feeling my age a little bit. I went to the doctor and uh, he says, do you have a living will? I wasn't there to talk about a living will. And, and so I just pushed it aside. I felt like it was kind of intrusive and depressing. And I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to think about it. My friend Carmen died recently. And she talked to her kids about her dying. And um, they were really good in helping her at the end. I was helping her. I was driving, you know, getting groceries and driving her to the doctor. But, but they were very supportive at the end and very like present at the end. Um, I have three kids and I don't know which one I would choose to, you know, to take care of, take care of things after I'm gone. Um, my daughter and I are close, but I wouldn't want my son to feel that I didn't trust him. He's older than she is. Um, I'm just, um, just not going to think about it for now. Okay, so Tracy, does any of that sound familiar to you? Oh boy, does it ever. Yeah. Um, you know, we all know Evelyn. I mean, if, if we're not there age-wise yet, we will be. And mm -hmm. we all have friends and family. And I think we, we can certainly relate to Evelyn. Yeah. How do you even get started? You know, it's not the most comfortable topic. Mm -hmm. um, as a society, we're pretty um, death denying and okay. we tend to put things off that we really don't feel comfortable addressing. I think most people know somewhere that it is important, but it's getting that's getting started. I was having that conversation with my own husband recently. Okay. <laughs> um, and he was saying, you know, without my doing the work that I do mm -hmm. and understanding the importance of these forms and how they are applied, mm -hmm. he wouldn't even know where to begin. Okay, so that, that does sound complicated. But so then should we wait for our doctors to bring it up? Like should people rely on their doctor to talk about living wills and advanced care planning and health proxies? So I think Evelyn pointed out that she went to the doctor to talk about her health. Right. She didn't go to talk about a living will. And why okay. was he that even being asked, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime you go to a medical facility, whether it's a doctor's office, an outpatient setting, or to a hospital, um, since 1991, they're obligated to ask you. Really? Because, that long ago? Mm-hmm because of the Patient Self-Determination Act. So anybody receiving Medicare or Medicaid dollars mm -hmm. is obligated to ask the regulatory question of, do oh, you wow. have? Oh, interesting, okay. So they're not trying to talk you out of care, right? Uh, but they're trying to document who they should reach out to if needed. It's important to establish and to, for them to know mm -hmm. because the document exists for a time when you won't be able to speak for yourself. Right, right. Right. So um, you do not need 
to wait for someone else to bring it up. In fact, it's best for when they bring it up to say, and here it is. Okay. I've, it's an interactive, um, you know, relationship. Okay. It's, it's not something that you should depend on the hospital or the doctor right. to, to raise. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But they're not really there for that purpose. But as part of your total health care plan, mm -hmm. you know, whether, what medications you take, what diagnoses you have, what, medi what vitamins are best for you, it's important to also address if things got serious, whether it was through a sudden situation mm -hmm. or COVID, whether right. a car accident or whether it was because of a serious illness. Um, however you land in the situation and whenever you land in the situation where you're not capable of speaking for yourself, okay. they need to know who mm -hmm. can do this for you. Okay. And better to be prepared and think about it long before right. you're in a crisis situation Right. and to have your documents in order. I think um, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. Okay. You know, and um, e Evelyn's just getting started. She's beginning to think about these things, as, as most people are. And um, it's time to start considering them when you are healthier, mm -hmm. such as Evelyn right now. And you know that you've got a future of aging. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, think about it more like a fire drill. If You know, the analogy of the fire drill. If you, you don't want to um, get into a situation with a fire and not ever have practice with a fire drill. That's true. That's true. And I think you also told me once that having a fire drill doesn't make the fire happen. So don't be afraid to have that fire drill. Absolutely. It, it will make you feel more prepared and confident. It doesn't make a fire not happen, mm -hmm. right? But it makes you feel like you can manage it better. Okay. And it's less traumatizing if you feel more confident. Okay. Now, Evelyn, like she hinted a little bit about thinking about it when she said she doesn't know which of her kids to choose to take care of things after, after she's gone. But we're not talking just about wills and estate planning, right? We're talking about, like you said, being prepared, being prepared for whatever comes down the road. COVID, car accident, long-term illness, you don't know what's going to, what your situation is going to be until you get there. Correct. And when I bring this up with a lot of patients and families, they assume that we're talking about um, after they're gone. You right. Know, a will. And it's confusing because we hear the term living will. But think mm -hmm. about it this way. It's while you are living, you okay. are creating a living, breathing document okay. that is supposed to age with you okay. and change with you throughout life. So every state has um, kinship laws. Kinship laws meaning that there's a hierarchy of decision making that gets followed. Mm -hmm. It normally falls to the spouse okay. automatically. Behind that, if there is no spouse, um, it would fall to an adult child, or right. I'm sorry, it would fall to adult children. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, well, it's probably going to go to the eldest, and it doesn't automatically. If there are five children, five children have equal say about oh. this parent. Okay. So you can imagine how complicated this can get when there are more than one child. Right. Right? And then it goes into a, a following a pecking order. Um, so we go to you know, parents, we go to adult uh, siblings, mm -hmm. um, but we don't want that. Right. You know, that slows everything down right. at a time that very often very quick decisions need to be made. Right. Right. So Evelyn was conflicted about who to choose of her children. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people experience those feelings too. I don't, I don't want to show favoritism. I'm worried if I pick this one, then how's this one going to feel? Right. Um, the most important thing is really to think about who knows me best, not who's physically the closest geographically. Okay. That doesn't matter either. Okay. But who's ready, willing, and able to speak on my behalf. Okay, so let's visit Evelyn again. It's 10 years later, mm -hmm. and Evelyn is now retired. She's now a grandmother of four and living with a chronic progressive disease. She's begun to have some limitations, including a decrease in energy. Let's see what's going on with Evelyn now. The last 10 years have brought lots of change. I retired five years ago, and I had my first grandchild, and then right after that, 
Now I have four. And they're so active. It's really very, very hard to keep up with them. I don't have the same energy that I used to have. And, uh, you know, I feel it. I'm tired a lot. When I went to the doctor, he uh, diagnosed me with emphysema. And uh, it's not curable, but it's controllable. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking my medication. Another big thing that happened is that I lost my father. And before my father died, you know, towards the end of his life, my brothers and I, we just had, um, we just couldn't agree on what to do and how to do it. And then when he died, how to deal with it, how, how to deal with it when he died. There's still a lot of problems in the family um, because we didn't, a lot of hard feelings. It's a very sensitive subject. We really should have done something. Um, talked about it beforehand with my dad. My, um, my kids, you know, my friend Carmen died. And when Carmen died, she had spent time talking to her kids about it, about her leaving and, and all. And they were very um, good handling the last days of her life and, and the, the aftermath of her death. Should really do something. I should really talk to my kids, but um, I don't know. I think my daughter should be the one to handle things. Maybe I could make the doctor talk to her so that it would be like more professional and more business like. So Tracy, what do you see as the important changes in Evelyn's life and her views on advanced care planning now? Well, I think the biggest takeaway for me in listening to Evelyn was that she has had some experiences now. Okay. That she can draw upon. You know, um, her own loss of her father mm -hmm. and the juxtaposition between that and the loss of her friend Carmen. Right, right. Right. So her friend Carmen... Um, Carmen's family talked openly, probably didn't enjoy the topic of the conversation, but they valued open dialogue. Okay. And it showed. She talks about how much more peaceful things were for Carmen, not only when she was dying, but afterwards for Carmen's family, that mm -hmm. they're still intact. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the conflict between her siblings and her because they didn't address what dad would want or not mm -hmm. want. Right. And there was conflict around that, and they haven't recovered from it. We, I hear this a lot, you know, and I can tell you there's a huge difference between families that have had um, open dialogue and have tackled hard conversations mm -hmm. versus those that haven't. We, we do the person no favor, nor the family afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people, if they could see what happens at the time and then after with their family, they would, yeah. they would regret not having had this, this, this important dialogue. Okay. okay. Um, when Evan, Evelyn talks about losing her father, she says that she wishes her family, her father and siblings, had talked about what to do and how to do it beforehand. And um, like you said, it really does seem like she regrets it. And still 10 years later, she's talking about the difference between mm -hmm. her family and Carmen's family and the conflict and the last of conflict, lack of conflict. So, you know, Evelyn talked about how still 10 years later, she was impressed with Carmen's family and what they did, and more recently, her family, and she regrets it. It wasn't handled well. They were fighting. Um, but she still says at the end, she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the doctor to bring it up. She's still mm -hmm. kind of hesitant about that. So... What advice would you give her for to take those next steps and start that conversation with her family? Well, I definitely would start with not waiting for someone else to bring it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, to be proactive. Um, I think it's important to remember that while, you know, well-meaning, a lot of physicians are not comfortable with this conversation. But aren't they trained to talk about this in med they're school? They're not. Oh. They're not. Okay. They are more now so. They're okay. in medical school because people have gotten more, un, you know, uh, 
uh, of the understanding that, of the importance of getting training in this area. Mm -hmm. But I think that we assume way too much. We assume the hospital's going to know my wishes. We assume that they're going to know right. what's too much for me. We, we assume that the doctor is going to take the lead. And, and the doctor, um, I know, means well, mm -hmm. but may not know what's too much for you. Okay. And, and they're, that's not what they're trained to do. Um, they're trained to try to help you get better and to treat you. Right. And to offer interventions to you. Okay. There's very few doctors that have actually received training in this area or want to discuss it with you. Mm -hmm. So you and your family really have to take the leadership and let the doctor know this partnership, this is important to me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to need your help. These are my values. Mm -hmm. I am... Um, went to a new doctor a couple of years ago, and when I went into the doctor's appointment, of course I look at this and I saw that it wasn't even addressed on the intake form. Oh, wow. And I brought it up, I said, I gotta let you know, this is what I do, this is important to me, and we're a partnership. I need to know that you can honor and respect my values mm -hmm. and my needs um, and work with my family. If you can't, then we probably need to be, you know, um, meeting with another with another clinician, okay. so so I could see from the what a doctor might see is if they had ten patients with a similar situation, and nine of them choose something like let's say it's a surgery or a course of treatment, that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Right. It might work for others, but it not, might not be work right for you, and that's what we really need to talk about. Okay, so you know Evelyn sounds like she's thinking about it, but she still wants to put it off. What tips would you give Evelyn for just how to dig in and get started with this? Well, I think it's important to first consider. You know, the paperwork, albeit important, mm -hmm. is the final part of a three-step process. Okay. It starts with considering, thinking on it, allowing yourself to think about your mortality, your aging. These are not easy things. There's a reason why people avoid this. Right. Right. right? So considering is first. Uh, reflecting on family experiences. Think about your family tree and how this, what kind of illnesses your family has faced, okay. what kinds of situations. Think about what you thought about that, what you felt about that. Would you want that? Was that too much? What, would you have stopped there? Would you have kept going? Uh, so and so, you know, is you know, dependent on life support, is living their life in a nursing home bed. Mm -hmm. Would you want to live that way? Just begin to, to think on it. So considering. And then also, who do I really feel comfortable with in my life talking to about these okay. things? Who's going to allow me? You know, not everybody is comfortable. Um, so step one would really be to reflect. Mm -hmm. And then think about who you really want to include in this conversation. Okay. Like anything that's well planned, it's often done in many steps. Okay. It's not a one and done. Okay. And so setting the stage. Who do I want to talk to? How do I want to do this? Do I want to do it over dinner? Do I want to call a family meeting? Mm -hmm. Do I want to have um, a go wish activity card in front of us and we talk about um, what values matter to us when we think about aging or end of life care. Okay. And um, just really begin to, to bullet down what feels right to you. Sometimes writing a letter to your family oh. and letting them know that I need to talk about this, this is important to me. Mm -hmm. I would also say don't, don't give up, be persistent. Okay. So if they don't want to hear it or they brush it off and are uncomfortable, Try again. <laughs> yeah, maybe you need a little pause and even say, I can see that this is hard for you. It's not an easy topic to talk about, but it's really important. This is what matters to me. Mm -hmm. And I need to know that, that, that somebody's got my back, um, you know, at a time that I won't be able to speak for myself. Right. It's, it's as important for the person who's going to be the patient as much as it is a gift to the family mm -hmm. because they're really um, giving their family a roadmap, a flashlight, at a time when things might feel very dark and overwhelming mm -hmm. and they might feel lost and they'll be so glad to have mm -hmm. you know a document um, in their their loved ones writing to, to kind of guide them uh, to give them that roadmap to help it make it maybe a little bit less traumatic a little bit less stressful mm -hmm. and hopefully leave them intact um, 
So I think it's important to maybe fire a little bit of a warning shot. Okay. <laughs> this is something I'm going to want to talk to you about. When is a good time? When is a good place? Every family's different. Right. You know, but think about who needs to be involved in that dialogue. And um, just remember that it's not a one and done. It's something okay. that you, you, you circle back to. In my own family, um, we've chosen April 16th um, every year because it's National Health Care Decisions mm -hmm. Day. And we check in. We take an hour to sit and talk, my immediate family, and check in on, I want to make sure I understand what your wishes are. This is what your stopping point is. This is who you've chosen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because things change over time. Mm -hmm. um, I myself have already done two uh, living wills, and I hope to live many more years to be mm -hmm. able to do many more times. Right. But as you age, as your health status changes, mm -hmm. as your understanding of what is going on with your your condition, what you would want or not want changes, what's mm -hmm. being offered medically. That's true, it treatments changes change. Too. Absolutely. So let's go back and visit Evelyn again. Um, Evelyn is 10 years have gone by and she's been living with COPD for the last 10 years. She has begun to consider her own end of life care and wants to talk about it with her family. And she hopes that it's gonna avoid the family conflict that happened when her father died. She talked to her kids about what she would want for the future and in different situations. So let's see where Evelyn is now. So my, my health is declining. I had some serious setbacks. One night, in the middle of the night, I couldn't breathe. Turns out it was pneumonia. But the next morning I asked my, um, my neighbor to drive me to the doctor and she did. And the doctor was appalled. Um, he sent me to the hospital right from the waiting room in his office. And I was there for two weeks. And I had, you know, this equipment and, and stuff. I, I, I'm very glad to be back home. So I, I began to speak to my kids about, about this whole idea of um, dying. And what, there were tears. And, but we're on the other side of the tears now. Told them about Carmen and how helpful it was to Carmen that she had spoken with her kids, helpful to her and helpful to them. And um, so we're moving along. I really want to be in my home. I want people to visit me in my home. I don't want to be in a hospital if I can help it. And um, you know, things were terrible when my father died because nobody talked about it. Nobody organized anything. Nobody, you know, checked out exactly what my father wanted. I don't want that to be. I would like things to be more planned. So, Tracy, it looks like Evelyn's come a long way. Yeah. She's, she's talked to her family. It sounds like it was hard. She said there were tears, but now they're on the other side of the tears. Um, and still, you know, 20 years later, she's still remembering this example of a family that had the conversation, had plans, and how well that went compared to her own family, where they didn't talk and there was confusion and there was fighting about what her father wanted. And, you know, she still has these two extreme examples of a family that handled it one way and her own family handled it another way. And she wants that better way. She wants to know that things are going to be handled in the best way possible. So, you know, what do you think about where Evelyn is now mm -hmm. and is there anything that she still needs to do? So that's an excellent question. I just have to say Evelyn has come a long way um, medically, but also you can tell she's reflected a lot. Mm -hmm. um, that was a poignant example, uh, you know, with her father and with Carmen. Mm -hmm. And I think it stayed with her. And she's also had a lot more um, health issues mm -hmm. since then. She's been hospitalized a lot more. Right. She's had a lot more time to really think think on it and is really beginning to decide that maybe she's at a point where there's medical interventions that she no longer wants. Okay. That, you know, she's weighed the benefits versus the burdens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how everybody really needs to approach um, medical care as an age aging person is what really matters to me most now? Right, what are right. my priorities? 
And I think Evelyn is beginning to really understand that she's more comfortable at home. Right. That she would rather not be in the hospital if she doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And good for her for having the conversation with her children. Mm -hmm. Sounds like she's really figured out who's the best person. Mm -hmm. Not meaning, not meaning that she doesn't love her other children, but she's got this one that she really feels gets her and will advocate for her. Um, so by now, she's already had a living will. Mm -hmm. She's already identified her daughter as her health care proxy. Right. However, those are great documents, but they have limits. They are okay. only conversation starters. I think by now, Evelyn has realized that to have CPR or to be hooked onto a ventilator or to have dialysis in her condition mm -hmm. or cancer treatment, mm -hmm. she no longer really values medical care for those things and she's right. focusing on comfort mm -hmm. at this stage of her life. So a living will, as good as it is, will not protect her from having those interventions done to her. Mm -hmm. If she wants to be home and she wants to be comfortable and really only have to go to the hospital, mm -hmm. if she's in such a bad way that her comfort needs can't be met at home, she needs something that was drafted, created in New Jersey um, about 10, 11 years ago called a POLST. P-O-L-S-T. Okay. And it stands for Practitioner Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Okay. It's an actionable uh, medical order that can be completed by a doctor, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a document that goes at, at home on your refrigerator. If you're living in a nursing home, it's in your chart. Mm -hmm. But EMS is trained to look at the refrigerator to see. Oh, okay. And it starts with what are your goals? What matters to you at this stage of your life? And what care do you want or not want? For okay. example, if you don't want CPR, that can be indicated on there. Okay. If you don't want to be on a ventilator, that can be indicated on there. And it just stays there. It doesn't mean that they won't care for you. Right. It right. doesn't limit, except for these red lines that you might want to draw, care that would be too much for you, that would likely not help achieve Evelyn's goal of right. staying home. So we've seen Evelyn come a long way. Over 20 mm -hmm. years, she starts with, you know, I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. The doctor brought it up. I'm going to push it aside. And then she has life experiences to compare it to. And she, you know, starts to think about it, but still thinks the doctor or someone else would take care of it. And then she comes to the point where She's had the conversation. She talked to her children. She's made important decisions. Um, do you think that's kind of typical of what most people go through? They, they, it comes in phases and stages as they make these decisions? Yes, it does, it does go in stages. But unfortunately, I actually think most people don't address it okay. until it's a crisis time. Okay. Until they're, you know, they're in a hospital and um, the axe is being brought down on some kind of very big medical decision mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, emotions are high. Right, definitely. And rational thought does not prevail. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the studies show that when people are uh, in a high emotion situation, mm -hmm. they elect more care than what they likely would have elected had they been doing this from the comfort mm -hmm. of their living room at, or at their kitchen table Interesting. or in a calm conversation with their practitioner in an office setting. So emotions run high and your decisions would be different. Absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, in the old days, a lot of these decisions were not even having to be made. How come? And when, well, a lot of the interventions uh, were not really being used. Oh, right. And what was thought to be maybe a temporary thing is actually now being used for life sustaining, not even just a temporary thing. A lot mm -hmm. of these interventions were meant to be a bridge to wellness mm -hmm. and they're not. Now they're becoming life prolonging. Okay. And you know, the, a lot of these things, more common sense were not offered, but mm -hmm. now they've become routine practice mm -hmm. and the physicians are including the, the patient and family in the decision making, which is great. But the downside of that is Patients and families are being asked to make very complicated health care decisions 
They haven't gone to medical school. Right. They don't necessarily understand the outcomes of all of these decisions, and um, but they have to live with them. Mm. And um, the burden of the decision making has been transferred to the family. Okay. And there's a rise, unfortunately, in PTSD following people being in ICU. Oh. Uh, even if you survive, there's a residual trauma. Um, because of the burden of all those very heavy decisions. Wow. So it truly is such a gift to your family if you let them know ahead of time what you would find unacceptable. Okay. Because it, it reduces their grief, reduces the trauma and, and the intensity of their bereavement. Mm -hmm. So Tracy, thank you for all of this today. This is very insightful and it's very helpful. And before we go, can you tell us some of the resources and the forms that people should look for. Um, and I think all of these you can find if you do an internet search and we have them posted on our website at njaaw.org. But what are some of the top ones that we've talked about today that people should look for and become familiar with? The good news is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. There's a plethora of resources available, um, good resources uh, to help you get started. Okay. So every adult, healthy or otherwise, should at least have identified a health care proxy. Okay. On the state of New Jersey, there's a website uh, with the state that uh, offers a very simple form where you can just name who is going to be my health care proxy and who would be an alternate to them if the first person was unwilling or unavailable. Mm -hmm. And the state also offers a living will component, which includes the health care proxy Mm -hmm. And now also gets a little bit more detailed about articulating your wishes on life support. Okay. That's the living will component okay. of the document. As a person ages or experiences serious illness and now is very firm that they want to limit care, mm -hmm. uh, that person, usually somebody who is within the last year or two of their life, would want to have a post form in addition to the other forms. Okay. Um, because it's, an, it's a doctor's order that has to be honored, not just a conversation starter. Okay. So those are the forms that people should have. And I'd like to also say not to put them in your safety deposit box. Right. <laughs> right? Not to, they're not, they're not a valuable. They're not, they're not diamonds. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they need to be accessible. A lot of people will put them in a Ziploc bag and just keep them like on the refrigerator, on the side. Right. They need to be it, accessible. You yeah. need to be able to find them quickly. Absolutely. So, uh, but as far as getting the conversation going, there's a lot of great resources out there. I'd like to direct you to the Goals of Care Coalition of New Jersey's website because mm -hmm. there's videos, there's documents, and mm -hmm. they're, they're for professionals as well as for the patient and mm -hmm. the family. Um, and I think that they're, you know, they're easy to read, easy to use, very helpful resources. Okay. Um, there's a Let's Talk uh, guide. Mm -hmm. They also have a valuable tool called a four-step eye care plan, which helps you kind of navigate. We're dealing with kind of a serious situation here. Mm -hmm. What can, is a formula we can use to kind of work through to help elicit what we want to do or not want to do? It's, it's a little bit of a workbook. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, another wonderful organization called the conversationproject.org. Mm -hmm. And um, there's tons of resources on there that help you get the conversation started. I just want to point a few out to you. Okay. This is called your conversation starter guide. Your guide to being a healthcare proxy. Your guide to choosing a healthcare proxy. Okay. And very easy to follow booklets that ask you questions that help you um, figure out how to get going and how to proceed. I like this one. This is your guide for talking with a healthcare team. Because okay. we talked about how a lot of healthcare professionals are not equipped. Right. And when you go, if you've done this and this is important to you, you want to make sure that you know how to approach it with your mm -hmm. healthcare team. Because you can't assume that they will approach it or they're going to bring it up or even that they're comfortable with it. Correct. The onus is really on you. It's your healthcare. Mm -hmm. So... 
Um, I like this one because it's specifically about people with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia okay, because that's there's more things to consider. And this is also a good work, uh, workbook, What Matters to Me. It really, it's, it's a workbook for people with serious illness. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, like I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's all here for you. Right. Um, these are great tools and resources um, to, to get communication started. Right. And, you know, I would read one. I would give one to somebody that you want to have a conversation with. We've got to, let's tackle this together. Well, these are great and really helpful, and I want to thank you again for joining us today. And I know that this year on, on National Decisions Day, I am going to take the time to go over this with my family, like you did with yours. That was a wonderful suggestion. And um, I hope that our viewers find something useful and relatable here. Um, I also want to thank our, our special guest, Evelyn, who mm -hmm. is Tonya Moore, the chair of the South Orange Senior Advisory Committee, for taking on that role for us today. And I want to thank you all for watching this episode of Aging Insights, soon also to be a podcast. To find out more information and to view our previous episodes, please visit our website at njaaw.org and click on Aging Insights. Aging Insights is brought to you with the support of the Wallerstein Foundation for Geriatric Life Improvement, our funders, supporters, and viewers like you. I want to thank our partners here at PCTV for helping us bring our guests to you today. And if you need information or resources about services in your area, you can contact your county office on aging. Their phone number can be found on our website, or you can dial the state hotline at 877-222-3737. New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well wants to remind you to stay safe and healthy. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time.